Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to be talking about cicadas, and we had an interview with Oyvind from Air Things, and we talked about their radon detectors. Cicadas and radon. Good combination. <laughs> We'd like to thank Jen from Everyday Old House on Twitter for liking and sharing the podcast, and she's at... at Everyday Old House, and Everyday is spelled E-V-R-Y-D-A-Y, then Old House. And book five is going to be free until Tuesday, August 14th on Amazon. So it's called Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, book five. Please download it. Give us a five-star rating and review. And you can download it to any device, so you don't have to have a Kindle. Any smart device, you just put an app on it, and you can download the book for free. And after... Tuesday, August 14th, it's only going to be a dollar. Mm-hmm. The oldest fossil found of a cicada was dated back about 110 million years, and it was found in an ancient deposit of amber in Burma. So trees use amber as a defense mechanism for boring insects. It's sticky, and it flows out of the holes created by insects, and it traps them. And if that sap drops off and gets buried, it can harden and preserve insects for millions of years. Just like Jurassic Park. (laughs) Right. So in the same amber deposit in Burma, they found baby birds, worms, aquatic spiders, and 99 million year old frogs. Hmm. Cicada comes from the Latin meaning tree cricket. They're oval in shape as an adult. They have large wings that extend past their bodies, six legs and five eyes. Hmm. So they have two large compound eyes, and in between them, they have three smaller eyes that entomologists think they use to detect light. The two compound eyes are usually red, but they can be white, blue, yellow, or multicolored, and they have straw-like mouth parts to drink sap. Mm -hmm. So they're usually around an inch and a half long, but there's thousands of types, so they can range from around three quarters of an inch to two and a half inches long. Most are going to have black bodies, but they can vary in color from brown to green. How long do they live? There's two main types of cicadas, annual and periodical. The annual cicadas live two to six years, but there's quite a few different species, so it can vary. And if you're in an area that has a few different types, they're developing and emerging at different times. So in some areas, you can hear them every summer. The periodical cicadas have primarily a 13 or 17 year life cycle, but some emerge after 21 years underground. Wild, huh? So they're living 21 years underground. Right. And then how long are they alive above ground? Depending on the species, probably four to five weeks. Hmm. (laughs) So in the 1890s, an entomologist grouped the 13 and 17 year cicadas into 30 different broods, and each was based on the year they emerged, and he assigned each one a Roman numeral, So some of these are now extinct, and scientists think that there's only about 15 broods left in the U.S. Hmm. Do cicadas live in other countries? You can find them anywhere in the world except Antarctica. And in the U.S., they're primarily in the Midwest and the East Coast. In the Chicago area, scientists think that brood 13 and brood 19 are both going to emerge at the same time in 2024. The University of Illinois Extension says May of 2024 could be one of the largest emergences of cicadas with tens to hundreds of thousands per acre. Mm, Lucky us. If you're in an average subdivision in a city, you have about five homes per acre. Just to give you a feel, can you imagine that? Five homes, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of cicadas. No. (laughs) An an acre in the U.S. is 43,560 square feet. A football field is 48,000 square feet. So what do you mean in the U.S. an acre is whatever you just said? What's interesting about the word acre is it comes from an old English word that means a field that can be plowed by a yoke of oxen in one day. So how could that be different? So evidently oxen are faster in some countries than other countries. (laughs) Do you think we'll be able to record a podcast in 2024? (laughs) It'll be too loud. We might have to take a month off. (laughs) So it's wild how they make the noise. They have a small ribbed structure called a timbal about halfway down their body, and the muscles around the timbals pull in and out to create the sound. One scientist said it's like a bendy straw being pulled open and shut very, very fast. (laughs) 
So the males are making the sound to attract females, but not all males can make the sound. Scientists are calling this a song, and each species has a different song. The National Geographic says that some cicadas can be heard up to a mile away. And a story I read in the Chicago Tribune said in 1990, some areas had so many cicadas that they had to use snow shovels to clear the sidewalks. Oh, that's gross. <laughs> Last week here, it was super loud with right. the cicadas singing. Right, crazy. And this week, there's nothing. Yeah, fantastic. So, like, what's happened? <laughs> Most of them are dead. <laughs> So the adult cicadas, you know, like last week, they're attracting each other, uh -huh. and they mate, and then a week or so later, the females start to lay eggs in the branches of trees, so that's probably what's going on now. They're cutting slits in the branches and laying a group of eggs. Some species can lay 400 to 600 eggs, wow. and then in about six weeks, the nymphs, they hatch, they drop to the ground, or the branches die and drop off, uh -huh. and the nymphs dig into the soil till they find grass roots to feed on. Then they move down to the roots of the tree or the shrub they were in. Okay. How big are they? So they're about the size of a grain of rice. They have mouth parts that are straw-like so they can suck up sap from tree and plant roots. Hmm. They're now going to spend the next 2 to 21 years underground. Are they hibernating? Entomologists now say they're active most of their life underground. They're tunneling and feeding on fluids in the roots rather than being dormant. Some scientists say that they're beneficial to the soil because they're aerating the soil around plants' roots. And scientists don't agree on how they know when to emerge. Some think that they're keeping track of the yearly changes in sugars and proteins in the tree's roots. Hmm. But once they emerge, they're going to climb up a tree or a plant and shed their exoskeleton. So they're going from an insect with no wings to having very large wings, but they're not very good at flying. <laughs> Pliny the Elder made the observation in his natural history book that female cicadas are attracted to the male's noise. The adult females can also be attracted to vibration from power tools. People have been swarmed while using their lawn mowers, leaf blowers, and drills. That would be terrible. So one suggestion is to mow your lawn early in the morning if you have a lot of cicadas. They're going to be less active then. So they don't, like, bite or anything. Right? No, their mouth parts are straw-like, and they don't damage. A lot of people are worried about their garden plants, but they don't have the mouth parts to chew the leaves up, hmm. or even, you know, fruit or vegetables. So besides the noise, what's the problem with them? You have to watch your pets. Dogs and cats will eat cicadas, and they aren't dangerous, but some animals will gorge on them and get sick. Hmm. Scientists think periodical cicadas evolve to emerge in such high numbers to overwhelm predators, because they just get tired of eating them. <laughs> And because 13 and 17 are prime numbers, scientists think it's harder for predators to synchronize with the emergence. The annual cicada, though, has a predator called the cicada killer wasp. The female wasp hunts for cicadas to feed her larva. After a cicada killer mates, she digs a burrow in the ground and creates a series of egg chambers. She tracks down a cicada and stings it to paralyze it. She drags it into her burrow and tucks it into an egg chamber. Then she lays an egg on the paralyzed cicada and seals up the chamber. That egg hatches in a couple of days, and the larva then feeds on the still-living paralyzed cicada. <laughs> Wild, huh? Mm -hmm. Your enjoyment of this is disturbing. <laughs> if you're in an area where there's a lot of cicadas in the trees, you have to watch out for cicada rain or honeydew. Cicadas ingest so much fluid that they urinate a lot, so you can get rained on under a tree. That's gross. You can eat cicadas. Native Americans would roast them. Some restaurants serve them. A Missouri ice cream shop makes cicada-flavored ice cream. And a blog I read said female periodical cicadas are the best. They're low in fat, good balance of vitamins, high in protein, and taste like canned asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever eat one? No, I don't think so. How about you? No. Do you have to protect your trees and plants? Most of the full-grown trees aren't going to be affected by cicadas. They're primarily looking for pencil-sized branches of trees. They're going to cut a small slit into it and deposit their eggs. So those small branch tips on a full-grown tree may be damaged or even fall off, but it's not going to affect the overall health of the tree. Hmm. If you have small trees, though, or young ornamentals or fruit trees... If they have pencil-sized branches, they can be damaged. So most pros are recommending covering your fruit and small ornamental trees with a mesh netting. Okay. The U.S. Forest Service suggests using the lollipop method to protect small trees and young trees against periodical cicadas. What's that? 
They want you to drape a quarter inch or smaller mesh over the tree so that the mesh completely covers it all the way to the ground and use zip ties to connect multiple sections. Mm. You're going to pull the mesh down against the base of the trunk and use soft plant ties wrapped around the base and that's going to hold it in place. And this is going to allow air and light in but no cicadas. And you don't want to use chemicals. They're not effective with large amounts of periodical cicadas and you're going to end up just poisoning birds, squirrels, and other animals that are eating them. Okay. Garden plants usually aren't bothered too much. Cicadas are primarily looking for thin, woody branches to lay their eggs, and they're not chewing the leaves of your garden plants. They don't have the mouth parts for it. But you may want to cover your garden with mesh if you have grapevines, blueberries, and raspberries, because they're known to go after those plants. Hmm. You're looking for soft, flexible netting to drape over your trees and plants. It's usually going to be called garden netting, plant netting, or bird netting. And most hardware stores and home centers are going to have rolls of this. And you're looking for mesh with quarter inch or smaller openings. Some of the garden and bird netting is going to be half inch, three quarter, or one inch. And cicadas can work through those openings. Hmm. And if you're shopping online, bird be gone, it's B-I-R-D dash B dash g-o-n-e it's the only one i found with quarter inch netting i looked at a bunch of other manufacturers and they didn't have the sizes listed hmm. we had an interview with air things and they have radon detectors that continually monitor your air quality Oi, Vint, how you doing great thanks cindy and i did a project recently at her cousin's and we used your air things home radon detector and her cousin in his basement had long-term radon levels of over seven and short-term of over nine. We just thought your radon detector was so nice, we'd like to get some more information. Yes, that was using the the, the AirThings home detector, which is very, very easy to use, lightweight, portable, battery operated uh, with with a nice display. It shows you the long-term average as well as the short-term average, both for the last 24 hours and the, the last seven days. So it's a very handy device to, to have keep control of your radon level. What I liked about it is they were able to test the basement where they found the high levels, and then they were able to bring it upstairs and see substantial difference in the readings upstairs. Yeah, that's the key there. It's also very handy to check your living room as well as at your bedrooms because you really want to monitor radon in, in those rooms where you spend most of your time. Because, uh, I mean, radon is, is a leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers in the U.S., and, and it's responsible for more than 21,000 deaths every year, people Basically. getting lung cancer because of radon, and according to EPA. So it's a serious issue, and people should really take care and, and monitor for it. So this is an invisible radioactive gas that we're breathing in, Correct. It actually comes from uranium that's in the soil in, in the earth. So what we see is all over the U.S. is affected by, by this and all, all around the world, actually. But there are local variations. There are state-by-state state variations. There are some areas where, where there's much higher levels than, than others. But there's no way to know if you don't monitor for it. Because we see areas that are, in average, not very high. But And you think your neighbor, okay, he was fine, but then you monitor, oh, I had very high levels. So house-to-house house variations are, are very, very high. Interesting. And the, the interesting as well is that the rate level varies significantly over time, from day to day, from week to week, and year to year. So that's why also EPA says you should do long-term monitoring, which you can do with these electronic instruments like AirThings Home or, or AirThings Wave. That's the key. You need to do long-term monitoring in order to know your radon level. Well, I really like the home detector because it's portable, but you say you have the WAVE, W-A-V-E? Yes, correct. So that's a smart radon detector that gives you all the data on on a smartphone. Uh, Very nice app, both for iPhones and Android phones. And it monitors radon, also temperature and humidity. Um, And you can follow this over time, you can follow graphs over time if you want to do that. And it will provide you with notifications if there's anything that's uh, above uh, certain limits. Uh, So it gives you really peace of mind. It also gives you access to a a nice dashboard online where you can log in and and see a lot more details. And you can even just wave your hand in front of the AirThings wave. 
and it will light up green, yellow, or red, depending on your <laughs> indoor air quality. So it's very, very easy to use as well. And it looks like a smoke detector? Yeah, it, it has a nice uh, design. It's, it's like the size of a smoke detector, and you can have it on your wall or, or on, uh, in the ceiling. And does it matter the placement? The best placement is always to have it in the same height as you are most of the time breathing in the air. Radon mixes very well with the air inside a room, so it doesn't really make a big difference. That's smart, though, to put it at the level where you're breathing. And then yeah. where, where would you place this in a home? Because radon causes lung cancer, it's important to have it in the rooms where you spend most of your time. Okay. So typically, we recommend people to have it in living rooms or in bedrooms. And for sure, the lower floors are the worst. So if you have living room or bedrooms in the basement, for sure, you should put it there. But also first floors and second floors, uh, you should check your, your radon level. If you live in high-rise buildings, typically the radon level is not high. But we see examples of radon that comes also very high in some high-rise buildings, but it's more rare. Okay. A lot of new homeowners, they don't realize the impact it can have on your long-term health. And that's a, a challenge, and, and we also try to inform more about this. I mean, there is lots of information on the EPI homepage. You can Google a lot about it, but most people don't really think about radon. People hear about it sometimes when there's house transactions, but, I mean, how often do you sell or buy a home? Right. Because when that happens, typically a home inspector will check your home for radon in a very, very short period. But the thing with, with radon, it, it's affected by, uh, by the weather, it affects yeah, by the temperature, and it's also very much affected by even small, small earthquakes that, that you will never read about, but, okay. but that happens regularly, that opens up new cracks way down into the earth's crust for radon gas to, to seep into your home. So that's why it's always recommended to do long-term monitoring and so you can know if there's sudden rise in, in your radon level. So if you did a typical test, you could get a false sense of security and the levels could actually be much higher, the concentrations. Yes, this is a very common uh, problem. People do a one-time test, maybe over a week, and they think, oh, this was all good. But you actually don't know your radon level after one week. Well, it's pretty scary, like when we were in Cindy's cousin's house where, you know, I looked at the short-term reading, and it was over 9, and I think they recommend radon mitigation if it's anywhere around 4. Yes. So EPA has set the limit at 4 picocuries per liter. If it's 4 or above, you should mitigate for it. You should do something to reduce the, the level. Okay. And they even say that if it's above 2, you should recommend taking some actions. Really? And we provide the uh, recommendations uh, if you go to airthings.com on what you can do yourself. There, there's things you can do yourself, like getting more fresh air. It could be opening some vents. If you have some cracks in your foundation, you could cover those. If those simple things doesn't work, uh, we recommend that you contact a radon mitigator. So when they come in and they install a radon fan, um, the radon level typically goes way, way down. It, it's, uh, it gives a very, very good effect and gives you peace of mind. You should right. keep uh, monitoring because you never know when that fan stops working and sure. if something happens, but, but it's very, um, very effective, that yeah. those radon miti mitigators. Well, it's interesting. We put in a radon fan at his basement, and within 24 hours, I think it was right around 2, and then after a few days, it was just a little over 1. So it was pretty dramatic how quickly it changed the radon levels. And, of course, this it costs, I mean, a uh, typical radon mitigation could cost maybe from $1,000 up to maybe $3,000, depending on, on the house. But when you look at the danger of radon um, and, and doing that, I mean, it's, it's really worthwhile if you have high radon levels. Uh, right. Absolutely. So are there any other products you'd like to talk about? Yeah, so at AirThings, we are the leading provider of, of radon technology um, in, in U.S. today and also in, in Europe. And we really care about the indoor air quality because... If you look at the stats, I mean, typically we spend more than 90% of our time indoors. Uh, a lot of people think about outdoor air quality, uh, but 90% of the time we spend indoor. Right. So we really care about indoor air. And what we see in, in U.S. homes and schools and offices 
is that there is a lot of bad air, not only radon, but we also see volatile uh, organic compounds that comes from paint or new furniture or formaldehydes that, that can come from a range of different uh, items. And also that air is recycled a lot. In, in HVAC systems, typically they recycle the air, which means that you don't get fresh air from outside, which means that both VOC levels and carbon dioxide, CO2 levels, rise, which makes people more fatigued and tired. You can't really follow classes or you're tired when you're home. And this is very, very common. You have no idea about these factors if you don't monitor for it. So, so we have a new product now called AirThings Wave Plus, which monitors for volatile organic compounds, VOCs, CO2, radon, temperature, humidity, and, and provides you really a, a very good insight into this. And it is extremely easy to use. Yeah, very interesting. So I think it's good to check out uh, airthings.com, read up on, on radon. It's important for everyone to monitor for radon long term with a digital radon detector um, to, to keep yourself and your family safe. Well, I appreciate your time, Oyvind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That was interesting. What I like about the air things detectors is they're always on and you don't have to send anything into a lab. Right, it's and easy to use. And you're getting your long and your short-term results. So their versions, they have something called their home. That's that portable one that your cousin has. The Wave, W-A-V-E. They have the Wave Plus, and they're at airthings.com. It's A-I-R-T-H-I-N-G-S dot com. And that system we put into your cousin's house is is something very unique because a homeowner can do it themselves mm -hmm. and it's a churnland radon fan and churnland is t-j-e-r-n-l-u-n-d and you can check it out at churnland.com and you can check out the video so we did a step-by-step -step video of the installation and it's on our fix at home improvement channel mm -hmm. we call it a radon fan installation that's my sophisticated title <laughs> and you can search on YouTube radon fan installation and then probably put in fix it home improvement and it should take you to it give it a thumbs up <laughs> do you have anything else to add for small or young ornamental and fruit trees you want to cover it with mesh netting when you have a periodical emergence in your area you want that mesh quarter inch openings or smaller and when you're under a tree wear a hat <laughs> let's wrap this up you can check out our book, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, book five on Amazon. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, the Spotify mobile app, Google Podcasts, CastBox, Player FM, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. Thank you. Subscribe to that as well. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow Cindy on Twitter at fixitcohost. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.